morning, church family. Today's scripture reading is in the Old Testament book of Nahum. We're in Nahum chapter 1. We're going to begin our reading in verse 15, and we're going to read through the entirety of Nahum chapter 2. Behold, upon the mountains the feet of him who brings good news, who publishes peace. Keep your feasts, O Judah. Fulfill your vows, for never again shall the worthless pass through you. He is utterly cut off. The scatterer has come up against you. Man the ramparts. Watch the road. Dress for battle. Collect all your strength. For the Lord is restoring the majesty of Jacob as the majesty of Israel. For the plunderers have plundered them and ruined their branches. The shield of his mighty men is red. His soldiers are clothed in scarlet. The chariots come with flashing metal on the day he musters them. The cypress spears are brandished. The chariots race madly through the streets. They rush to and fro through the squares. They gleam like torches. They dark like, like, dart like lightning. He remembers his officers. They stumble as they go. They hasten to the wall. The siege tower is set up. The river gates are open. The palace melts away. Its mistress is stripped. She is carried off. Her slave girls lamenting, moaning like doves and beating their breasts. Nineveh is like a pool whose waters run away. Halt, halt, they cry. But none turns back. Plunder the silver, plunder the gold. There is no end of the treasure or of the wealth of all precious things. Desolate. Desolation and ruin, hearts melt and knees tremble. Anguish is in all loins. All faces grow pale. Where is the lion's den, the feeding place of the young lions, where the lion and lioness went, where his cubs were with none to disturb? The lion tore enough for his cubs and strangled prey for his lionesses. He filled his caves with prey and his dens with torn flesh. Behold, I am against you, declares the Lord of hosts. Now I will burn your chariots in smoke, and the sword shall devour your young lions. I will cut off your prey from the earth, and the voice of your messengers shall no longer be heard. This is God's holy word. Thanks be to God. Let's pray together. Almighty God, I thank you for your word. Thank you that you speak to us. I pray that your Holy Spirit would give us eyes to see the unseen, and give us hearts that rejoice in the truth of your good news. It's in Christ's name that we pray these things. Amen. Amen. You can have your seat today. We're in a time of the year that is known in the church calendar as the season of Lent. For those of you that are not familiar with Lent, Lent is essentially the, the six weeks that lead up to the Holy Day, the celebration of Easter, the celebration of the resurrection of the Son of God. And the reason Christians have observed Lent through the centuries before there was, you know, churches in America, before American Christianity even existed, Christians recognized that there was a need for us to understand the depth of sin, to understand the situation that sin puts us in so that we might marvel at our Savior that has been given to us, that we might understand sin in such a way that we see for the time that we have the need that we have for salvation that only Jesus Christ can bring. And one of the reasons that we are currently studying the Old Testament prophet of Nahum is because I would argue that it's actually rather a Lenten text. And it's not just because the prophet Nahum deals with darker themes, with themes of a judgment and, and themes that are somewhat filled with the end of sin being death. Rather, Nahum is a Lenten text, not just because of that darker tone, but it's because it shows us a new dimension of the nature of sin and salvation that we as Americans oftentimes tend to miss. You see, Americans live in what we might call a hyper individualistic culture. You might even say that we live in a systemically individualistic culture. This means that our culture actively shapes us and actively forms us to see our lives and to live our lives with the self at the center. We think of our own independence, our own autonomy, our own goals, our aspirations, our will as the very centerpiece of our reality. And here's the thing. No one has to teach you in America to be an individualist. It's something that is in the very air that we breathe together. And so, as a result of this, when Americans think of concepts like sin and salvation, we tend to think of these ideas 
in strictly individualistic terms. Now, sin, of course, is an individual reality. So is salvation. Sin is, of course, referring to the things that we do against God, the laws that we break, the ways that we disobey and rebel against him. And in the same way, salvation is a matter of God redeeming us and restoring us and having grace upon us as individuals. So the nature of sin and salvation are not less than individual realities, but according to the word of God, they are so much more. So the prophets of the Old Testament, I think, are uniquely helpful for us in this type of cultural landscape. Old Testament prophets, like the prophet Nahum, help us broaden our horizons and even see beyond our cultural blind spots of individualism. See, the prophets were given eyes not only to see the personal nature of sin, they were able to help us see the corporate and even the cosmic nature of sin as well. You see, sin does flow from the disordered desires of the human heart. But sin can also be woven into the very fabric of society. Sin can be encouraged and even enculturated through systems and through structures of this fallen world. And so a sin-fractured world is a world that favors the ruthless and makes it very difficult to challenge those who would abuse their power. A sin-fractured world incentivizes governments and industries and businesses to treat people as disposable utilities rather than those who are made in the image and likeness of God. A sin-fractured world provokes and intentionally incites the sin of lust as a way to market products or to entertain. A sin-fractured world rewards greed and corruption, and it oftentimes sees kindness and integrity as liabilities and weaknesses. A sin-fractured world, in the words of Psalm chapter 94, is a world that frames injustice by deceit, or it frames injustice, rather, by statute. You see, the prophet Nahum actually helps us imagine, helps us see this corporate and cosmic reality of sin as, as the world is represented by this wicked city named Nineveh the capital of the ancient Assyrian Empire. But even more, Nahum reminds us that the wickedness of this world will be brought to judgment. You see, this idea of divine judgment is no small matter in the Bible. The truth of divine judgment should fill our hearts with awe. It should fill our hearts with a sense of humility. But it should also fill our hearts with a sense of hope. See, for the outcome of God's Judgment it is not ultimate destruction. The outcome of God's judgment is ultimate justice. It's a vision of restoration, not only of broken hearts, but a restoration of this world that has been fractured by sin and death. In this way, Nahum teaches us to see God's judgment not only as something that we should fear, but also something that we should yearn for. Where we are to long for justice and to see the promise of God's justice, not just as a future reality, but profoundly good news. So our passage today is a vision of the good news of divine justice. And the first aspect that Nahum is going to allow us to see is really the downfall of the city of Nineveh as a historical fact. It's something that actually happened in history. See, over the course of this spring break, my little boys and I decided that we were going to start a movie marathon, and the series of movies that we chose was none other than Sylvester Stallone's Rocky. I was a little doubtful at first if I wanted to go back and watch these movies, but now I'm just so very, very happy. We absolutely loved every minute of it. And the story of Rocky is not just acted by Sylvester Stallone, it, it was actually the creation of Sylvester Stallone, something he wrote, something he directed. And it's about this underdog boxer who finally gets a shot at becoming the champion. But like any truly great story, it's about more than just boxing. It's about the psychology of competition and conflict. It's about overcoming one's fear. It's about standing toe-to-toe -to -toe with the challenge that is right in front of you, no matter how scary, no matter how strong that challenge looks, and refusing to back down. And in many ways, this is the exact type of mentality that is the backbone of the book of Nahum. 
The prophet is giving God's people a pep talk. He's speaking to this tiny kingdom named Judah, and he's telling them, don't lose hope, don't give up. In fact, he's commanding them to stand up, to be fearless, to be absolutely courageous in the face of what looks like a certain defeat. And defeat does look certain for the kingdom of Judah at this age of history. The empire of Assyria looks invincible. It's the most powerful nation on the planet that has already conquered every other nation that is around the nation of Judah. Nineveh, Assyria's capital, the the subject matter of the entire book of Nahum, might very well be the most populous, the most wealthy, the most impressive, and the most powerful city on the planet at this moment in history. You could say that Assyria is the undisputed champion of ancient Near East, and they now have their eyes set on the kingdom of Judah. But just then, the prophet Nahum announces that a new challenger has entered the ring. Assyria is impressive, but all they've done is they've taken on the paltry kingdoms of men. Sure, they've conquered a city-state here and there, but they have never gone to toe with an omnipotent God. They have yet to contend with the three-person creator of the cosmos, the great redeemer who delivers his people with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Thus, chapter 2 begins with a challenge from God directly to the king of Nineveh. God's saying, all right, big boy, square up, put up your hands. Let's see what you got. And so he tells his opponent, the scatterer has come up against you. Man the ramparts, watch the road, dress for battle, collect all your strength. God is saying to the city of Nineveh, to the armies of Assyria, give me your best. Don't hold anything back. And so Nineveh is now going to flex their power, their military might. Nahum goes into this portion of scripture that is richly descriptive. He's painting a picture with his words, and it's a poetic scene of soldiers drawing up in lines of battle. We see swords drawn, shields raised, soldiers clad in scarlet red robes. There are so many spears that it looks like a forest on the battlefield. Gleaming chariots dart forth with the speed of violence of a lightning strike. It's a vision of the impressiveness of military might and strength. It's a picture of military posturing and intimidation of the virtually undefeated Assyrian armies. But then suddenly in the middle of this text, without a clear transition, without a clear explanation, the scene automatically changes and shifts. Assyria's military officers are now seen as fleeing. The city walls are breached. The royal palace is overwhelmed as if it were overcome by a rushing flood. Women are weeping and wailing. Chaos erupts in the streets. The city's vast wealth is suddenly plundered. The great city of Nineveh, is fallen. Desolate, Nahum says. Desolation and ruin, hearts melt and knees tremble. Anguish in all its loins, all faces grow pale. That's quite the transition from the mighty army that we just saw described. In fact, this, this buildup and this anticipation with all of a sudden, this very, very momentary defeat actually reminds me of a scene in Raiders of the Lost Ark. If you remember, Indiana Jones, the archaeologist, is running through the streets of Cairo, and he faces this big, huge bad guy. He's dressed in black. He has this huge, massive sword, and he's doing all of these impressive maneuvers. He's showing off of his skill as a swordsman, and Indiana Jones just pulls out his pistol and shoots him, and he falls down dead. No fanfare. Now, there's this huge buildup for this really anticlimactic and almost this comical end and destruction, and this is exactly what just happened to the city of Nineveh. All the armies have amassed their great power. They are flexing as hard as they can that the battle ends without much fanfare at all. The battle ends without anyone breaking a sweat. The idea in Indiana Jones is that you shouldn't bring a sword to a gunfight, right? The idea in Nahum is God is reminding his people that the most impressive army, the most impressive might of the kingdoms of men do not pose even the slightest threat to the God of glory. But we must remember, Nahum is writing these words at a time when Assyria looks invulnerable. 
They look so powerful. Nahum is seeing something that the rest of the world cannot see. He is seeing something and proclaiming something that seems impossible, but just then the impossible happens. In the year 612 BC, Nineveh will be sacked and destroyed. The once greatest city in the world will be left in a pile of burnt ruins, conquered over and over again. In fact, just recently, Nineveh was conquered yet again, as recently as the year 2014, when ISIS took it over and destroyed several archaeological ruins. It's still being conquered today. The big idea is that Nahum's prophetic vision becomes verified historical reality. God's word endures. Then I think it's really interesting. Chapter 2 concludes with really what amounts to a final death blow to Nineveh's pride in the form of a taunt that comes from God. God compares the destruction of Nineveh with the hunting of a lion. And there's a reason that this particular boast against the king of Nineveh, I think, would have stung Assyria. See, the Assyrians were rather infatuated, not just with their military prowess, but their ability to be huntsmen. And they love to be able to depict scenes of the king hunting lions. In fact, if you go to the British Museum in London today, you can see a display of some of the sculptures that adorned the walls of the royal palace in Nineveh. And on one of those displays, you'll find a bar-relief depiction of a royal Assyrian lion hunt. At the time, these were some of the most remarkable sculptures ever made. And these particular sculptures describe a king known as Ashurbanipal. And he was probably the, the greatest king ever in Syri- Assyria. He was essentially the rule that, that reigned at the very zenith of Assyria's power. And interestingly, Ashurbanipal was also likely a direct contemporary of the prophet Nahum. And so, this scene is going to show Ashurbanipal's lion hunt in the middle of its progress. And again, the Assyrians are proud hunters. They love to hunt, but by Assyrian law, the only one who was allowed to hunt a lion was the king of Assyria. He was the only one allowed to do it. And usually these lion hunts were really of already captured lions, and it was something that happened as a public spectacle. In fact, it was done with a political purpose. The lion wasn't just seen as an intimidating predator. The lion was seen as a symbol of untamed chaos, the power of the natural world beyond human civilization. To, so to hunt and to prevail over the power of a lion was to flex the king of Assyria's power. It was a way to display the king's mastery and lordship over the created world, his mastery over chaos and nature itself. It was a way to project that the king of Assyria was larger than life, that he wasn't just any man. He was a type of God-man, a man that should be worshipped. But Nahum, the prophet, flips the metaphor. Here, it's not the king of Assyria that's the lion hunter. It is the Lord God of Israel. Yahweh is the lion hunter, and the king of Assyria is now the hunted lion. So the Lord asks, where is the lion's den? The feeding place of the young lions, where the lion and lioness went, where his cubs were, with none to disturb. The lion tore enough for his cubs and strangled prey for his lionesses. He filled his caves with prey and his dens with torn flesh. Behold, I am against you, declares the Lord of hosts. Now will burn your chariots in smoke, and the sword shall devour your young lions. I will cut off your prey from the earth, and the voice of your messengers shall no longer be heard. The power of the once invincible Nineveh has been brought to an end by the greater power of the God of Israel. Now, I I find that really fascinating and uh, amazing just because I'm a history nerd. But some of you might be asking, well, that's an interesting history lesson of the ancient Near East, but why in the world should we care today? And and first, to answer that question, I do believe that it is right and godly and good to always approach God's word with a sense of humility, with a sense of faith, that even when we don't immediately understand the Bible, that it is indeed inspired, that it's filled with authority, that it's profitable for teaching and for our instruction. It is something that God has chosen in his wisdom that we need. But even when it is hard, I think it's important for us to press through and to wrestle with the words of Scripture to help us see what it is saying. 
And the key to understanding a book like Nahum is to understand that prophecy in the Old Testament really was kind of a different genre all to itself. And one way you need to understand this is to understand Old Testament prophecy, it's not just a mere forecasting of the future. Old Testament prophecy was something that we would describe as apocalyptic. It's not describing the end of the world. That's not what that word means. It instead is the unveiling of uh, almost like a veil that lies over material reality. It allows us to see the unseen. When we read the words of prophecy, the Lord God is inviting us to see almost into the spiritual realm, to see his transcendence, to see his glory, to see his power that is greater than the power of evil. I pray that we would be a church that would be able to have unveiled eyes, to constantly live in an awareness of God's greater glory. See, biblical prophecy helps us have eyes that see the true nature of spiritual reality. That when the evil of this world seems unbearable, when suffering seems inescapable, when the powers of evil seem undefeatable, that the truth of God's word would give us eyes to see the unseen and to hope in a God that is mightier than the powers of evil and sin in this world. And that leads us to point number two. The downfall of Nineveh, not just as a historical reality, but also as an image of future hope. Nahum introduces the proclamation of Nineveh's defeat in a very peculiar way. Before we witness this very descriptive fall of the city of Nineveh, Nahum presents us with the image of a messenger. A messenger on the mountains bringing a message of good news. But interestingly, this is not the only place in the Bible where this exact language is used. In fact, we don't only see it in Nahum chapter 1, we also see it in Isaiah chapter 52. This is Isaiah's passage. Isaiah says, How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news who publishes peace, who brings good news of happiness, who publishes salvation, who says to Zion, your God reigns. The voice of your watchmen, they lift up their voice. Together they sing for joy, for eye to eye they see the return of the Lord to Zion. Break forth into singing, you waste places of Jerusalem, for the Lord has comforted his people. He has redeemed Jerusalem. The Lord has bared his holy arm before the eyes of all the nations, and the ends of the earth shall see the salvation of our God. If you know the context of both of these Old Testament prophets, it might actually initially confuse you because these are very parallel passages, but Nahum is supposed to be talking about the fall of Nineveh, the fall of the empire of Assyria. Isaiah, in chapter 52, is actually talking about Babylon, a completely different nation, a completely different enemy and threat to God's people, and he's envisioning the fall of the Babylonian empire. This is not an accident. Because you see, Nahum is talking about more than just Nineveh. And Isaiah is talking about more than just Babylon. The prophets of God are revealing something that is true about all kingdoms of men. They're speaking to a reality about all systems of power built on sin and injustice. They're saying something true about a world that's ruled by violence and oppression. The prophets are making an announcement against all the empires that exalt themselves to the place of divinity. They're reminding us that God's judgment is coming. That it's good news. That God hasn't forgotten his people. Even when the situation looks hopeless, God is at work. That history is indeed bending towards justice because God, our creator and redeemer, is bending it. He will not allow evil to go unpunished. He will hold all sin accountable. He will bring forth judgment and justice upon this world. Now this is a message of hope to be relieved of the evil of this world, that there is a day coming when evil will end. But it is also a message of warning. Because there are many times where even the people of God can be complicit with the evil of this world. Where we can bear guilt because of the evil of this world. And so, Nahum is, is showing the end of the world to give God's people an invitation into a better way. He's saying what is made very explicit in Isaiah, come out of the world because judgment is coming. Isaiah even will go so far to command, depart 
Depart, go out from there. Touch no unclean thing. Go out from the midst of her. Purify yourselves, you who bear the vessels of the Lord, for you shall not go out in haste, and you shall not go out in flat, for the Lord will go before you, and the God of Israel will be your rear God. See, God is saying to his people, yes, you're in the world, but you're not to be of this world. Don't join yourself to the kingdoms of this world. Don't make yourself allegiant to the kingdoms of this world. Don't let them become your identity. Do not let them become your hope. Don't allow yourself to become habituated and enslaved to the sin of this world. And instead, embrace a kingdom that gives us a better way. And that leads us to our third and final point today, which is the day of the Lord. See, this theme of cosmic judgment and salvation speaks to a major theme that pervades really all of the Old Testament prophets. And that theme is known as the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord is a day of divine judgment and wrath, a fearsome and awesome moment that's oftentimes prefigured by the fall of a city or the fall of a nation, but it's pointing towards a more ultimate reality and a more ultimate hope. I want to show you just how pervasive this theme is because, again, The day of the Lord is a huge idea in the Bible, but it's oftentimes a neglected idea in the American church. But I want to show you just how many prophets of the Old Testament care about this. Isaiah says, Wail, for the day of the Lord is near, as destruction from the Almighty will come. That day is the day of the Lord, the God of hosts, a day of vengeance to avenge himself on his foes, Jeremiah says. Ezekiel says, For the day is near, the day of the Lord is near. It will be a day of clouds, a time of doom for the nations. The prophet Joel, alas for the day, the day of the Lord is near, and its destruction from the Almighty, it comes. The prophet Obadiah, for the day of the Lord is near upon all nations. As you have said, as you have done, it shall be done to you. Your deeds shall return on your head. Now here's the complexity of the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord is to be rightly seen as a terrifying reality because the day of the Lord is a day of judgment. But at the same time, the day of the Lord is also to be a longed-for reality because it is also a day of justice. It's a hope that one day evil will be held to account, that the world will be put to rights, And this is a deep and aching cry all throughout Scripture, especially when you find the people of God in a place of suffering. This is how the psalmist in Psalm 94 will describe it. Oh, Lord, God of vengeance, oh, God of vengeance, shine forth, rise up, oh, judge of the earth, repay to the proud what they deserve. Oh, Lord, how long shall the wicked, how long shall the wicked exult? Now, while Nahum never actually writes down the words, the day of the Lord, his whole book is about this concept. It's about the concept of God's justice and judgment coming against all evil. The thing that Nahum gives us that I think is so unique and so important is that he wants us to know that the coming judgment of God is good news. In fact, Nahum's book might even be the earliest instance of the now famous phrase, good news. The term from which we derive the word gospel. And originally that phrase, good news, did not refer to a set of theological ideas or religious doctrines. Instead, good news primarily means a proclamation. Good news is an announcement. Think of the idea or the the illustration of an ancient king of a walled city who has gone forth to meet an army in battle. An invading force has come into his land, and the king has taken his mighty men, and he's gone forth out of the city to meet that foe and to stand against the coming threat. In such a moment, the people who are inside the city, they would be waiting in a posture of expectation. They would be waiting with vigilance. They would be waiting with a sense of urgency. They would long to know the outcome of what the king has done for his people. And so if the army lost, the king would send back a military advisor to help prepare the city for siege, to get ready for the day of battle that was going to continue and come. But if the army won, the king would not send back a military advisor. Instead, the king would send back a herald, a herald that would announce that the king had won, that the city should prepare for celebration as the king returns. 
Now, in order to understand this metaphor, Jerusalem is the city that's the capital city of the kingdom of Judah, and it's a city that's surrounded with mountains. It's not West Texas, right? In West Texas, you can see someone coming from about 20 miles away. That's not how Jerusalem is. Now, in Jerusalem, the mountains are actually rather close to a city. It, it actually encloses the city almost as a natural fortress. And so imagine being a watchman on Jerusalem city walls, longing to know the outcome, longing to hear news. And then you see, dark in the horizon, a runner that comes up over the mountain, and he's just close enough that you can make out the reality that this is not a military advisor. This is a herald, a herald on the hills. Behold how beautiful are his feet because he's coming and he's going to announce to us good news. That is what Nahum sees. He says, behold upon the mountains the feet of him who brings good news, who publishes peace. Keep your feast. Don't stop worshiping, Judah. Fulfill your vows, for never again shall the worthless pass through you. He is utterly cut off. And what is the good news that the prophet Nahum declares? It's the good news that the enemy is vanquished, that the lion has been defeated, that the day of the Lord, the day of justice has come, and that the day of the Lord is still yet to come. And with justice will come a restoration of all that has been broken. For the Lord is restoring the majesty of Jacob as the majesty of Israel, for plunderers have plundered them and ruined their branches. It's important to know these words were written to a fearful people, a people who were suffering, a people who felt like their entire lives and the entirety of their futures were contingent and uncertain. And in this way, Nahum reminds us that the Bible does not ignore our pain. The Bible is not unaware of our suffering and our sorrow. Instead, God's word acknowledges our pain and gives us comfort and hope that will not disappoint us. So if you're grieved, by the wickedness of this world. If you're grieved over the sin of this broken world, Nahum is for you. If you're incensed at corruption of the powerful and the oppression of the weak, Nahum is for you. If you want the powers of evil to be held to account and justice to come, Nahum is for you because the day of the Lord is coming. And the day of the Lord will come. Now Nineveh will fall, and that's really good news. But we also have to take into fact that Babylon is going to rise. In fact, Babylon is the kingdom that conquers Nineveh. And that's not good news, right? In fact, when we look at the story of human history, we see many empires rise and fall, empires that are filled with evil and oppression, and their mere existence shows us that there is still yet a need for a perfect justice that is yet to come. How will this ultimate justice come? Well, first we have to define and clearly understand how this perfect justice will not come. It's not going to come from the kingdom of this world. You see, just like the people of ancient times, we are often so tempted to put our hope in maybe a bigger bully that will rise up and take on the person that's been bullying us. We want a better kingdom, a mighty kingdom that will rise up and tackle the kingdom that has been bullying us when we respond to power of this world with power of this world, when we respond to the power of the sword with the power of the sword, it simply perpetuates a cycle of fallenness, of brokenness, and of violence. In this way, Babylon is not going to be the solution to a serious problem. In fact, it will be worse. And so if it's not through the power of the kingdom of man, how is it possible that God will keep his promise to bring forth true and lasting justice. How will God's kingdom come? And it's here at this moment that I think Isaiah's parallel passage, chapter 52, gives us the answer. It gives us a piece of the puzzle that we would otherwise not be able to see. Isaiah chapter 52, the same chapter that talks about the herald on the hills with good news, keeps going and it keeps talking, it keeps showing us a divine vision. And it shows us how the empires of men will be defeated and the unforeseen way that the kingdom of God will prevail. After declaring that this good news is coming, after commanding God's people to come out of the world, Isaiah ends chapter 52 with the beginning of a new vision. He proclaims, Behold my servant. Behold my servant shall act wisely. 
He shall be high and lifted up and shall be exalted. As many were astonished at you, his appearance was so marred beyond human semblance and his form beyond that of the children of mankind. So how shall he sprinkle many nations? Kings shall shut their mouths because of him. For that which has not been told them they see and that which they have not heard they understand. The prophets are inviting us to know and trust and see that yes, God's kingdom will prevail. And the restoration of this broken world will not come through political power or military might, but by one who is the suffering servant. God's kingdom will come through Jesus Christ and him crucified. And Isaiah then describes this vision of the suffering servant in a passage that is perhaps the clearest picture of Jesus' crucifixion in Old Testament prophecy. He declares, Surely, He has borne our griefs, carried our sorrow, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds, we are healed. Centuries after Nahum, centuries after Isaiah, Jesus Christ of Nazareth, The one who is completely God and completely man will be the one who is pierced for our transgressions. Whose chastisement that will bring us peace that is our good news. Now the cross of Jesus Christ, we now associate that as a religious symbol, but it originally was not a symbol of religion. It was a symbol of empire. It was the ultimate weapon of the empire of men. Death on a cross was slow and gruesome. It was a form of hanging designed for maximum suffering, maximum humiliation. That's why crosses were placed in high trafficked places, places with high visibility. The cross was a billboard that threatened, if you oppose the kingdom of man, this is what will happen to you. Now, we typically associate crucifixion with the Roman Empire. But it's also important to know that long before Rome ever existed, long before Rome ever had an empire, Assyria was crucifying people. And that practice went on from Assyria to Babylonia to Persia to Greece to Rome to all the empires of the ancient world. But what was once the ultimate symbol of the power of man will now become the ultimate symbol of the victory of the kingdom of God. Because in light of the gospel, The cross of Jesus Christ reminds us that for all who are in Christ Jesus, the sovereign judge that stands at the end of history is also the suffering servant. The cross reminds us that it's because he was broken, we will be restored. It reminds us that because he took the penalty of our sins, we will be made righteous. Because he experienced judgment, all injustice will be healed, all things will be made new. Redeemer Christian Church, may we behold with awe and with wonder the truth of God's judgment. May we learn to yearn for redemption and restoration of the sin fractured world. And may we celebrate the good news of divine justice. Amen. Amen. Let's pray together. God, I thank you for your word power that it possesses to illuminate our understanding, to to be able to see the unseen. Lord, I pray that wherever we've come from today, whatever we're facing, whatever we're battling, I pray that your Holy Spirit would remind us of the overwhelming power of our God, that your Holy Spirit would remind us to be able to, to see that judgment and justice against all evil is coming. Lord, I pray that we would rejoice in that truth as good news. So Lord, I pray for the overwhelmed. I pray for the discouraged. I pray for those that are heavy laden with a burden for the brokenness of this world that today we would be able to not just come to you confessing our own sins, but that we would come to you laying down our burdens for this world. That we would rest in the hope that your justice is coming that there is a day coming very soon when you will make all things new. So Lord, as we approach the the good news of Easter, as we approach the, the truth, the triumph of resurrection, help us to understand that the end of all sin is death, but that your power is greater than both sin and death. 
So, Lord, we love you. We thank you. We worship you today. It's in Christ Jesus we pray. Amen.